Dear William, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this special Perelman seminar dedicated to globalization and the law. We will have the pleasure and the honor to listen to and to discuss with William Twine. Uh, before giving the floor to William and to David Restrepo, who will chair this meeting, um, I would like to welcome colleagues coming from abroad, from um, Italy, from uh, the Netherlands, from uh, Switzerland, and also from other <laughs> universities here in Belgium, from the University of Ghent, Leuven, Antwerp, uh, Saint Louis. Uh, also, I would like to find the legal practitioners who join us today. This is a long time tradition uh, in Brussels to work, to collaborate with legal practitioners and also, of course, um, to welcome uh, colleagues from the ULB, the law faculty and members of the Perelman Center. We have quite a long tradition of uh, this kind of seminars uh, that started when Heim Perelman founded the National Center for Research in Logic in 1950 and this tradition was perpetuated within uh, the Center for Legal Philosophy from 1967. Uh, I just would like to drop a few names of distinguished a uh, professor uh, coming from abroad who participated at one point to these kind of seminars. Uh, Norberto Bobbio, Jürgen Habermas, Neil McCormick, more recently uh, Roman Dworkin, and today, of course, uh, William Twining. Uh, the idea to all this seminar with William Twining uh, emerged uh, during a, a very nice weekend that David and I spent at uh, William and Penelope Twining's lovely house uh, near the River Thames uh, in Oxford. Um, William had just accepted at this time to co-supervise uh, David's uh, PhD dissertation. And by the way, uh, I would like to say that um, on June 19th, um, we will have uh, the public defense of David Restrepo uh, PhD dissertation and of course we, you are all uh, most welcome to attend uh, this event. Details will be published uh, soon on our website. Um, I would like to take this, the opportunity of this seminar to uh, tell publicly, uh, to say publicly to William or oh, uh, I'm grateful to him uh, to have committed himself so deeply to um, the David's project and uh, David has, has certainly greatly benefited from uh, William Twining's um, expert guidance uh, in his work. So it seemed quite natural uh, that uh, David would chair this meeting and present our distinguished guests. So, David, uh, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benoit, um, for the presentation. And we are using microphones, not because we think you're dead, but it's just for recording reasons. So we have to use the microphones to get the right sound. Um, so indeed, yesterday I was going through my private defense and um, I was going facing a tough jury <laughs> yesterday and today I have the, the pleasure to be here without you. Um, so I'm not going to present in detail uh, Professor Twining because you have received in uh, the email we sent as invitation his main uh, pieces of work. But I do want to say um, that it is interesting to have him here here talking about globalization and legal scholarship because, because he is in a certain way what he calls himself a G skeptic. So skeptic of words starting by G, whether globalization or global law. And also legal scholarships is legal scholarship is one of the subjects that have uh, puzzled him uh, for a long time. So I think it is a good combination for having him here today. Um, he is uh, 
in my opinion, well placed to talk about this because he was born in Uganda and um, was in different countries, came back to England to um, study in Oxford and then moved to the US to um, work with um, the wedding and went back um, to East Africa to teach and then work in London for some time before was in, in Ireland and, and, and Warwick. So he has been around the world and this is maybe or maybe not one of the conditions to be critical or to embrace the G word. So um, this was my only um, point of introduction actually for this presentation, so I will give the floor to Professor Twain. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be at the Paramount Centre because Paramount was an important figure a bit on the edges of my consciousness when I um, started to develop a career in jurisprudence. It was Herbert Hart who, in fact, recommended that I should read him, both in English and in the huge volume with Colbert's Plética, um, in French. So it's a great pleasure, and I think that the kind of influences that have been on me, especially in the areas that, that Perron uh, contributed so much, um, a very similar background. So um, my background in those kind of um, areas include R.G. Collingwood, American pragmatism, especially Dewey, um, and then my close friend Neil McCormick, who late in his life really got involved in taking her on very seriously. <laughs> Second thing I want to say by way of um, start preliminaries is that I apologise for my linguistic deprivation. Between the ages of four and ten I was in Mauritius and I was very fluent in Creole. And I thought that this would give me a great advantage when I learned French at school in England. It did not. <laughs> my vocabulary was too rich, my grammar was non-existent, um, and I quite often came bottom in French. But actually, I understand a certain amount, and maybe 30 years ago, I might even have tried to address you in French, but the Creole keeps popping up. In my <coughs> very first year of teaching, in Khartoum, in the Sudan, I was given a course to teach, which I know Benoit has also captured, called Introduction to Law. And I wanted to get my Sudanese students to understand where the Sudan legal system, which had um, Sudan been a condominium, so it's essentially a colony when you get down to it, um, fitted some broader picture of law in the world. So I got a nice big green black map of the world with continents but not countries really um, outlined and I put coloured it in two main colours. Half the world was red which was for civil law, I wanted to get away from the colonial associations of redness, um, and the rest, the other half of the world was a sort of light green. And then this was a period of the Cold War, so I put in a few stripes um, for the Soviet <coughs> bloc. Um, <coughs> and this did a useful job in some ways. It explained to the students a little bit about where they fitted in and why they were studying Samangong talks in English. <laughs> Samangong talks was another <coughs> talks was another subject I was teaching, and when I got really behind in preparation, I got stuck on the law relating to animals. 
And the English law of related animals is full of lovely cases. It has horses jumping over hedges. It has a case called Filburn and the People's Palace, which is about an elephant in a circus trampling a dwarf. <laughs> and then one day, we came to the case where a child visiting London Zoo was bitten by a camel. And my students up to that point had been a bit passive. And suddenly a hand went up. A heart. Why was the camel in the zoo? <laughs> and at that point, it turned out that nearly all the facts of the cases we were studying in English law talks had no application whatsoever in the Sudan. And I just got the students interested and talking, but subverted my course. So the map had some uses, but I was even then dissatisfied with it. I couldn't fit in public international law. How do you put public international law on a map or um, I knew a little bit about hybrid systems, mixed civil and common law. Um, and I had and I could have, I think, solved that problem quite easily. But I was puzzled in more fundamental ways and left that on one side for some time as a project to be pursued. How do you map law in the world? When you were children, you probably played the game that I played when I was in Mauritius, but I'll do it with my current address. William Twining, 10 Mill Lane, Ifley, Oxford, Oxfordshire, Midlands, England, England and Wales, United Kingdom, Europe, the world, outer space. <laughs> and the great thing about that game, which I imagine most of you played as kids, is the centre of the world is where one happens to be. And it's a picture of the universe which puts oneself right in the centre of the universe, a universe of concentric circles that go broadening upwards. I want to suggest that law in the world is not like that. And all the talk of verticals and horizontals and diagonals in terms of patterns in, of law in the world are misleading. And it's much more complicated and much more messy. But there is a danger in thinking that the centre of the world is where one happens to be. And adopting a real global perspective then has a problem of what kind of standpoint um, are you going to adopt. You received two handouts and one of them is really the subject on which I'm going to talk. But the other is a particular background which you may well want to bring in to the discussion and challenge me on. The handout relates to a very specific project with a very specific audience. I wanted to provide a method for any legal scholar, any law student, any law teacher, to so that they could say, what does this so-called globalization mean for me? What does it mean for me in my doctoral dissertation topic? What does it, what does it mean for me if I'm teaching a course on the law of obligation? What does it mean for me um, if I'm a bit dissatisfied with the state of my own specialism? And one of the things about this audience, if it's addressed to academic lawyers, is that nearly all Western academic lawyers today are specialists. They have one or two strings to their bow, and they tend to be very much located in a particular area. And they tend to see people who specialise in family law or international law or company law or finance tend to see people interested in legal theory and people interested in globalisation as specialists. And so one of my difficulties with this work 
is to get the right audience. Um, because that's been its fate so far. Um, it's been perceived as a work of jurisprudence. It is not a work of jurisprudence. It's a work of applied jurisprudence addressed to any academic lawyer, postgraduate law student, um, so on. And it's addressed to them personally as individuals. If one is worried about all this talk, this G talk, as uh, David said, um, how can one set about thinking through whether it has any relevance to me and my work? And if so, what precisely and to what extent should I take it seriously? That's the, the question. Behind that, of course, um, this is applied jurisprudence. I have a whole lot of commitments in jurisprudence. Um, and uh, certainly on the table today, um, but I'm going to talk just about the method. Very quickly, globalization and other G words, um, there are two pretty standard meanings. Dozens of variations and um, dozens of attempts to theorize globalization as a set of processes or phenomenon or whatever. But I think we can make this very simple. The narrow meaning is really economic globalization, and it's what the anti-globalization movement claims to be against. If you study the anti-globalization movement, you see it's actually rather disparate, um, and so what they're against is probably rather disparate. For my purpose, that is a very important and perfectly legitimate usage of globalization, but it's not one I'm using today. I want to have a much broader conception, which includes not only political economy, but all the other ways in which our world is becoming more interdependent. And if you want a theoretical background for this, um, then Anthony Giddens is probably is good enough for me. But of course, if I'm addressing individual scholars, teachers, students in law, they will all have slightly different views of globalization. And since I'm trying to help them, I'm not trying to impose my views of globalization on them. So <clears throat> part of the thing is for each individual address to have their own view. I think the key idea with Giddens, and I think myself, is that if globalization is interpreted in terms of various kinds of processes, events, and so on, that increase interdependence throughout the world in social relations and economic relations and cultural relations and political relations and so on, um, that one needs to emphasize that interdependence is a relative matter greater and smaller proximities of various different kinds. And so it's quite natural that when people use words like globalization, they um, tend to spread it out to include not only the whole world, but even really quite narrow, proximate, um, cross-border um, kinds of relations. And I understand that, and I think I've given up on trying to restrict globalization to the world as a whole. Um, and so I'm prepared to acknowledge that um, it has broader application. And out of that comes a really important point that when I've been thinking about trying to construct pictures of law in the world, very often the most important and significant patterns of a general kind are subclinical, not covering the whole world. There's never been a global empire, or a global language, or a world war, or a global epidemic, or a global religion, and so on. And all in other disciplines, which 
deal with this, um, there are all sorts of atlases which tell you quite a lot of, give you quite a lot of information about migration, about language, about different kinds of economy, etc. But the idea that there's some sort of flat world, as Friedman says, I think is not yet true, and I very much doubt if it ever will be true. So I'm prepared to be pretty liberal about G words, um, but I have been teaching, of course, until recently in the States, called globalization and law. So I use the word. The first thing I do in the very first class is ban all the G words from the classroom. <laughs> no student, I'm allowed to use it, but no student may use the G word unless they justify it. And at that stage, I want them to justify it in terms of meaning genuinely worldwide or having some other justification for using it. And they all get the point. Um, and so, for weeks on end, G words won't actually um, crop up. So we don't talk about global law and global law firms um, and global law of education and so on. Um, it's prohibited uh, because it's some quite impossible to justify uh, such terms according to the rules of the game that I have laid down. And we just have to be very careful about making generalisations about law in the world. And this is not really a matter of the concept of law. It's basically because in Western traditions, both the civil law tradition and the common law tradition in their various forms, the main focus of attention historically has been on municipal law of single countries, sovereign nation states, or sometimes single jurisdictions beneath nation states outside. And so we have not, in either tradition, developed concepts, methods, hypotheses, theories, etc., which can cope with the law of the world. And just to provoke you a little bit, um, I think that most empirical generalizations about law in the world are either meaningless, exaggerated, misleading, superficial, ethnocentric, or just plain false. And it's practically impossible to make a non-trivial empirical generalization about law in the world. You can come back to me on that. There's a standard joke um, in, which goes around in globalization circles. It's really pedantic to say that the World Cup of football is not global. <laughs> it's pushing it a bit to say the World Cup of cricket, which is 16 nations and a few, just adding on at the moment. That's really pushing it a bit, but you could say it's the best cricketers in the world who are doing it, but it, on the whole, you can do a map, a cricket map of the world, and you see what's got to do with empire and, and so on, with a few exceptions. Um, at the World Series of Baseball, <laughs> uh, that's hype. <laughs> or maybe it's just that people, Americans have forgotten that the World Series was sponsored by the New York World the newspaper. Um, so it wasn't claiming to be anything so expansive. Now, I don't want to go on for too long, but let me just say a little bit about my method, the method I'm recommending to you. I have a rather expansive view of the idea of legal theory, jurisprudence, way beyond just narrow legal philosophy, etc. 
And I won't try to elaborate on that now. But one way of looking at some aspects of jurisprudence is as an activity as opposed to a heritage or set of texts or something. It's theorizing. And one of the most important kinds of theorizing is critical study of assumptions and presuppositions of legal discourse, law talk, talk about law, how do you like to do it? So it's a criticism of assumptions. And I've made this joke too often, but I am still the founder and only member of the self-critical legal studies movement. <laughs> and the method I am recommending is essentially self-criticism. And so in your handout, there are three models. They're ideal types, and as you know, ideal types don't claim to be universal and so on. They're just, they're just models. And they have no particular um, claims. I mean, my, the first one, Western tradition of academic laws and simplistic assumptions. I'm not claiming that these propositions are universally held by Western academics. It's just that they're around. And if you don't like that list, you can subtract from it or add to it as you will. It has no particular status, except that after spending nearly 20 years thinking about globalization, I thought that these were the kind of ideas that were being challenged by globalization at the most general level. And we can discuss particular ones of those if you want. The second and third um, were constructed in somewhat different ways. So the second on comparative law, which I constructed in the 1980s, the late 80s, um, I did a systematic study of what leading comparative lawyers had said about their subject. Not a systematic study of their practice, which I think was much richer and more subtle and nuanced than what they said about comparative law subject. And I built up this ideal type of what they tended to say. Um, focused on municipal legal systems. It was mainly confined to modern Western capitalist legal systems. Um, particularly in the Anglo-American tradition, where micro comparison was given much more emphasis than macro comparison. If you had the René Javis Grand System, okay, they had non-Western traditions and so on, um, eccentrically included in certain ways. But um, so what, it, what I, this was really was talking about people talking about micro comparative law. Um, but the main distinction was in my as in my original map between common law and civil law and the sort of assumption that the world is divided into common law and civil law, and that's, you know, the basic distinction. And this would be very popular with La Porta et al., who David and I <laughs> criticised, um, for their absurd ideas about the, the generalisation that the common law systems are more efficient at promoting economic development than the civil law. It's a nonsense thesis. Uh, <clears throat> it tends to focus on legal doctrine, the comparison of concepts, rules, principles, and so on, uh, rather than more empirical kind of concerns about, uh, about institutions, processes, actors, uh, etc. And for quite good reasons in the history of comparative law in the 20th century, are largely focused in practice on private law. Since 1985, comparative constitutional law, comparative international law, although that was um, more popular in the days of the Cold War, and you could contrast Soviet bloc international law with uh, <coughs> Western bloc international law. Um, and they really were terribly sure about the purpose of uh, enterprise, and so of all legal subjects, comparative law has been the most introspective, and probably still is. There's some doubt 
as to whether it makes sense of that subject. Since I think we are all comparatists now in some sense, um, I don't think we should be too worried about that aspect. Since I did that study and constructed this idea of fire, um, there's been a new way of um, internal criticism of comparative law, self-criticism, and so on. And so a new way of neuroses that have developed over the last 15 or 20 years and have led to great diversity in what people think of counts as our comparative The third thing gets me back to my map. As I said, I, even at the time, in 1958, I was worried that a picture of law in the world with in two colours and a few stripes was inadequate as a way of depicting law in the world. And so the very first article I ever wrote, I wrote about what was then called reception, later became called transplants, because Alan Watson is now, I hope, going to be called diffusion because that is the term used in the social sciences for the spread of ideas and influences and models and so on and the influence of one social system on another and, and things like that. And, and it's a huge sociological literature on diffusion, which on the whole the legal scholars ignore. But that might be so great because on the whole the Social scientists have totally ignored the law, other than at the very beginnings when there was a big debate in anthropology about um, <coughs> parallel growth or, or everything being diffusion or human beings are being incapable of inventing institutions, they just copied institutions. It was a rather silly debate. It may still be around in anthropology, I don't know, but um, I don't think we need to worry about it. So I wrote this piece called Some Aspects of Reception, in which I tried to go a bit further by looking at why and how legal systems influenced each other. And then, about the same amount of time, no, a little less than our Jack van der Linden and I last met each other in Addis Ababa in the 60s. Uh, I came back to it and tore it to pieces, trashed it. By then I knew a good deal more about the topic, but I was also read some of the social science literature, so I used very standard social science concepts to suggest that what I'd written in 1958 it was published in the 1957 Sudan Law Journal, but that was because it was behind Shedley um, in publication. <laughs> um, and um, I just went through and I asked what was I assuming? And in light of my knowledge of um, diffusion of law, how this was really naive, simplistic, misleading. Chart here, but if you just take change agents, change agents is a sociological term, um, I assumed that reception was a matter of one government receiving stuff from the other government, part of the colonial government, um, but it was a government to government kind of um, interaction. One of the images that diffusion, I think, is the um, American settlers going out west carrying Blackstone in their saddlebags. There are other images in diffusion. Um, diffusion of religion, for instance, can follow various patterns of immigration. Soldiers carry law with them. Immigrants carry law with them. Probably the main um, vehicle of diffusion is literature, um, rather than government. That, that all around the world, 
law students don't only read about the law of their own jurisdiction. And so all the American, although the American parents build up barriers against foreign influence to water down American law, all the law clerks, who, clerks um, who write the opinions of federal court, Supreme Court, etc., cannot but have been exposed to ideas and doctrines and, and um, theories and so on from other countries. It's, you just can't escape. You can't, and of course in Europe we know this very well, you can't study law in Europe only by studying Belgium or French, etc. It's just not possible. Whether well, it's the European Convention on Human Rights or EU law or other matters, um, we have already broken out from that. So, the method is quite simple. If you've got, if you've written something, it's probably the easiest way to make self-criticism, it's easier if you've got something to criticise. Um, or maybe your, your course that you're teaching on family law. Go through the first set of very general ideas and ask yourself, how many of these have I been assuming in that work? And if you find that you have been focusing on municipal law, nation state, it's not wrong. Um, it may be perfectly legitimate to, for certain purposes to, to have that focus. It's just a question of um, going through that list and deciding whether you need to rethink a few assumptions. And then, if you look at the first article you ever wrote, um, the first piece you ever wrote, and you know a bit more about the subject, and what was I assuming when I wrote that, and given globalisation, um, what difference should adopting the global trajectory make, um, you might end up changing your mind on a few things. Thank you very much.